today it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Allison Windles, who's an assistant professor of medicine in our Department of Medicine. Um, Allison is one of our hometown heroes. She's a graduate of Georgetown, Georgetown's School of Medicine, Georgetown's Internal Medicine Program. She served as a Georgetown chief medical resident. She's been inducted into the Gold Humanism Society and had received the RD Teaching Award. Uh, but clearly her most important accolade and award was uh, being the champion penmanship uh, person for the state of New Jersey. Um, she's totally committed to primary care and she now serves as an associate program director within our uh, department. Uh, she leads our superlative ambulatory education training program. Um, she leads didactic sessions for our house staff on multiple topics, including preventive medicine guidelines, um, anemia, chronic kidney disease, women's health, uh, influenza and upper respiratory tract infections, joint symptoms, sexually transmitted infections, and acne. So really all across the board for primary care. Um, she's currently a co-PI with several of us in, uh, in a multi-center study looking at self-regulated learning to improve examination performance in at-risk medical students. Um, and today she will be talking to us on the topic, I originally thought it was about beer, but I hear that it's the topic of polypharmacy and the geriatric population. Um, partway through this talk, we'll break up into groups and uh, I'll manage that for you. So if that works well, um, that will be me. Um, so with that. Great, well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Wilson. It's, it's fun to be a Georgetown lifer and to actually have the opportunity to give grand rounds at this point. So um, I'm going to give my presentation today on polypharmacy in the geriatric population. So I have no financial disclosures. I will admit that I'm easily bribed by chocolate chip cookies, but I have no outside funding at this time. So I have three objectives for my talk today. Um, first, I'd like to do an overview of the problem. So what exactly is polypharmacy? Why does it happen? And then why do we care about it? What is the downstream effect of polypharmacy on our elderly patients? The second objective is reviewing beer's criteria. And I know Dr. Wilson was excited about maybe hearing a talk about beer. Um, but this is a criteria put out by the American Geriatric Society. It was recently updated in 2019, and we're going to review what medications and what classifications go into Beer's criteria. So you can use this as a resource when you're thinking about your patients who are coming in with polypharmacy. We're going to have three case studies to highlight how we can use this Beer's criteria on an actual patient, um, and that's when we'll be breaking up into small groups and reconvening um, as a whole. And then finally, I'd like to touch on the concept of de-prescribing. So first of all, what is de-prescribing? Why do we as physicians and then our patients sometimes have hesitation when it comes to de-prescribing, what barriers there are to this process? And then I wanna review one tool that I think can be helpful um, in aiding us in de-prescribing. So first we'll touch on the problem of polypharmacy. And in a nutshell, it's just too many drugs. Um, there is the official definition that polypharmacy is considered five or more medications. And I will say that this does not have to be prescription medications. So oftentimes we pull up a pharmacy record and we can see what drugs have been prescribed either by ourselves or by other physicians. But oftentimes patients are going to their pharmacist and asking for recommendations on over-the-counter pain relief, um, antihistamines. Um, they're doing some late night, uh, as seen on TV, shopping for supplements to help their um, energy. And so all of these medications can be considered um, potentially harmful, and especially when they're taking five or more. There was a systematic review that actually looked at the definition of polypharmacy, because at times it's variable within the literature, and they found that there is a consensus that um, five or more medications is considered polypharmacy. And we know that polypharmacy affects 50% of adults 65 and older. Now, there is 
a subset of polypharmacy called hyperpolypharmacy, and that's considered when a patient is on 10 or more medications, and this affects roughly 12% of our older adults. So it's crazy to think that maybe one in 10 of our patients will be on 10 or more medications. And I know we all at Georgetown have seen this when we admit a patient into the hospital or we have someone coming into our clinic and half of the screen of um, MedConnect is taken up by their medication list. So we definitely see this on a regular basis at our hospital. So when we look at the burden of polypharmacy in the older adult population, I think it could be helpful to see the overall prescribing patterns by age in the U.S. So there's a study put out by the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey looking over the decade period from 2007 to 2016, and it looked to see what percent of patients divided by age groups are on one or more prescription medications. And as you can see, in the pediatric population, up to 30% of patients are on one prescription medication. Middle-aged adults, it's a 50-50 whether or not they're going to have a prescription medication, but 90% of our elderly folks have one prescription medication. And we can see that in the all age group category and the very young pediatric age group category that there has been a statistically significant decrease in the trend of prescribing over this decade. But unfortunately, there's been no change in our elderly population. When I reviewed the data from the 1997 to 2006 um, survey, it did show that actually for the 60 and over group, there was a statistically significant increase in prescription over that decade period. So at least at this point, we're holding steady, but by no means are we making any trends to decrease that. So at this point, I'd like to review some patient factors as well as system factors that lead to polypharmacy for our patients. So first and foremost, multiple comorbid conditions. We have very sick patients here at Georgetown, and we are lucky in that they get to have multiple physicians taking care of them. Um, but we all know our patients have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, maybe a transplant, um, musculoskeletal pain. And the more conditions they have, the more likely they are to be on medications for those conditions. It's known as well that for patients who have a psychiatric comorbidity, those in the 65 and over age group actually are prescribed more medications for that specific condition compared to um, patients in a younger cohort with the actual same diagnosis. Another factor that relates to um, polypharmacy in our patients is that sometimes we try and treat the side effects of other medications. So oftentimes we as physicians, when we initiate a medication, we're good at explaining why this is an important medication, but we're always not the best about explaining possible side effects where patients don't necessarily think to associate the timing of a new medication with the development of a side effect. And so there actually was a study, I think it was in JAMA this past year, that actually showed that we as physicians are bad at recognizing medication side effects and oftentimes treat medication side effects with another prescription aimed at symptom management rather than trying to figure out the etiology of that new symptom. My favorite example, and I saw this with one of our um, interns in clinic this week, is amlodipine. We all know that amlodipine causes peripheral edema, and this patient was coming in requesting prescription for Lasix. A previous physician had prescribed that for her edema in the past, and we tried to explain to her that actually stopping her amlodipine, especially since her blood pressure was in the 100s, um, was a reasonable way to manage her edema rather than just throwing another medication at her. The third factor that affects our patients is that they have multiple specialists. Just like they have multiple medical conditions, they also have multiple specialists who are sometimes managing these, um, these conditions. And we here at MedStar Georgetown are so lucky, especially as primary care doctors, that we get to collaborate with so many of our other specialists in managing these patients, especially when they get very complicated. But as the old adage goes, too many cooks sometimes spoil the broth. 
And so we have multiple people who are tweaking medications and very much looking at the patient from a specific lens. So looking at it from a cardiovascular perspective or an endocrine perspective or an orthopedic perspective. And sometimes they don't look at the big picture or don't have the time to think about any other comorbidities that this patient may have. And so they prescribe medications without thinking big picture. The next point I'm obviously biased about, but sometimes patients do not have a primary care physician who has the outlook that we should be thinking big picture. I will say that I'm not always thinking big picture at every single visit, but definitely when a patient comes in for a primary care annual physical, there are definitely questions that I'm thinking about in my geriatric population that don't come up at a normal visit or come up when I'm reviewing medications. I like to think about how are they functioning at home? Can they complete their IADLs and ADLs? How are they taking their medications? Are they going through and actually refilling it every month or every 90 days as they should, or am I noticing gaps in that? Um, can they describe back to me how they're taking their medications? And then are they falling at home or having some cognitive decline that they or family members are concerned about? And doing a medication review is actually really important at that point. And then finally, we know that patients who reside in long-term care facilities or spend an extended time in subacute rehab do have multiple medications on their list. And there are many factors that relate to this. One, physicians in long-term care facilities are managing multiple patients on a day-to-day -day basis and don't have that nuanced time or relationship with these patients necessarily to have a very individualized discussion and management of their medications. We also know that these patients tend to get more medications aimed at symptom management rather than treating underlying conditions. So when we admit a patient into the hospital from a long-term care facility, I can't tell you how many times they had four medications on for their constipation management um, rather than thinking about, well, are they constipated because they're dehydrated and, oh yeah, they're coming in with an AKI. Um, or is it that the food at the long-term care facility is not appropriate and that's why they're having constipation. System factors now that can contribute to our um, polypharmacy in our older patients is our EMR. So I love being able to prescribe electronically and I love getting the renewal request in my inbox. And I say, okay, yep, that person still needs their blood pressure medication, accept three refills, and it takes 30 seconds max, and then I've just renewed their medication. However, um, the interface between EMRs and pharmacies are not perfect. Anytime we stop a medication, that information is not transmitted to a patient's pharmacy. And I'll use the example of one of my patients who is on amlodipine for hypertension. He developed some proteinuria, and we made the decision together to switch him to lisinopril. I sent in a 30-day prescription. He developed a cough in two weeks. And I said, okay, lisinopril's not for you. Let's try Losartan. Sent in a 30-day prescription of Losartan. The patient developed severe fatigue um, that was basically time-wise related to the initiation of Losartan and unrelated to any other factors. And so we made the shared decision to go back to the amlodipine and monitor his very mild proteinuria. I can't tell you, I think I received three refill requests for Lysinopril and four refill requests for Losartan. And if I hadn't remembered that this was the patient that I stopped both of those medications on, or if one of my colleagues was covering, if I was out for the day, um, it would have been very easy to just click, yes, accept refill um, and potentially cause significant side effects for the patient. The other thing too, is that we have outdated medication lists. Um, again, it's nice that through the EMR, and especially if you're working in a coordinated care center like the hospital here, that we have all of our prescriptions prescribed by the multiple providers all on one list. However, our patients don't always see physicians just within one medical system um, or medications that we prescribe for acute indications, antibiotics, antispasmodics, that trial of lisinopril for my patient. Um, sometimes remain on the list. And unfortunately, it's up to us to actually manually remove those, especially if they go to another physician. 
The only way we know that a new prescription was prescribed is if the patient tells us, which doesn't always happen, or if we go into the external medication history, so five more clicks in MedConnect, um, to actually look at the pharmacy record and see what has been prescribed elsewhere. I can't tell you how many times I've found out that patients have visited urgent care for reasons unbeknownst to me, or I've had one or two patients now seeing pain management and on chronic opioids that I didn't know about. So more steps for us to kind of go through and pull together a comprehensive medication list. And then finally, there are disease-specific guidelines and targets. And these are extremely helpful when trying to manage our patients who have heart failure or diabetes or other chronic medical conditions. But I always like to remind myself that this is population-based guidelines. We know that on a population base, it'll improve morbidity and mortality if we meet these guidelines or targets. However, it's not individualized. So when I have a patient in front of me, I actually need to think about, does this guideline make sense in the context of this patient's life? So now that we know the definition of polypharmacy, the prevalence in older adults and the patient and system factors that contribute to polypharmacy, I think it can be helpful to think about cause and effect on the patient level. So this chart from Carzina et al, summarizes the social determinants of health that lead to specific health conditions and therefore polypharmacy, but then the bi-directional nature of polypharmacy on negative outcomes for our patients. So as you can see, there are things we can't change about our patients, so age or gender, and then their health habits as well, which hopefully we can influence. So develop health conditions, and sometimes that in and of itself will lead to negative outcomes like falls, frailty, cognitive impairment, but obviously the medications we prescribe for those health conditions can also cause these negative outcomes. And I will say too that after a patient is hospitalized or has a fall or has an adverse drug event, there is, the patients are at increased risk for being prescribed more medications to manage that negative outcome, which adds to their polypharmacy and sometimes leads to this vicious cycle. To briefly talk about frailty as a negative outcome, frailty is a clinically recognizable state of increased vulnerability resulting from age-associated decline in reserve and function across multiple physiologic systems such that the ability to cope with everyday or acute stressors is compromised. There are multiple different scales to assess frailty, and there is an association between frailty and polypharmacy, but unfortunately at this time, since frailty is a very hard concept to grasp or quantify, there's no causality between polypharmacy causing frailty. So we all have a, a gestalt, a sense of what a frail individual is, um, but unfortunately we don't have any data to back up that polypharmacy leads to frailty. So overall, as a whole, we worry about sending our elderly folks to the hospital because of medications we prescribe. So data from the CDC states that in the past year, there are 1.3 million ER visits per year and 350,000 hospitalizations related to adverse drug events. And this is in the general population. They also noted that older adults, so our 65 and older group, visit the emergency department almost 450,000 times each year, which is more than twice as often as our younger persons. So it's definitely something that our older patients significantly suffer more from and adds cost burden to our health system and ultimately negative outcomes for our patients. So now that we've reviewed the background, on polypharmacy, I'd like to spend a little time talking about Beer's criteria. So Beer's criteria was started in 1991 by a geriatrician Mark H. Beer's, and he developed a list of medications that had adverse effects or that should be worrisome or cause pause, uh, cause physicians to pause when prescribing in older adults. In the past decade or so, the American Geriatric Society has taken over this review and it's made by an interdisciplinary expert panel. They conduct a comprehensive systematic review of the literature, looking at studies that cite adverse drug reactions in the 65 and older population. 
They usually publish updates every three to four years. So this one in 2019 was an update of the 2015 beers criteria. Notable changes from the 2015 criteria was that they removed medications that just really aren't commonly prescribed anymore. And then they also removed medications that were not uh, that caused adverse drug reactions that were not unique to the older population. They added a few medications as well that cause side effects that are either higher risk or unique to the geriatric population. If I had to place Beer's criteria on my slides, it would probably take up another 10 slides and we could spend at least a good half hour to an hour reviewing all of these medications in a very cursory way. So what I figured I'd do is over the next two slides, discuss the, the eight different tables in Beer's criteria and how you could use them or what tables you should look at when um, thinking about inappropriate medications for older adults. So table two is the first table in Beer's criteria and it's a medication list of potentially inappropriate meds to use in older adults. It's first separated by body system, and then within each body system, what different classes of drugs. And so we have cardiovascular drugs such as amiodarone, alpha blockers, or in the CNS category, we have antidepressants, antipsychotics, or benzodiazepines. For table three, this is a list of potentially inappropriate medications that we use in older adults that are inappropriate because they either cause drug disease or drug syndrome interactions that may actually exacerbate the disease or symptoms. So an example that I use to illustrate this is the condition of syncope. They recommend avoiding alpha-1 blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, antipsychotics, and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Table four is a table of drugs that should be used with caution in older adults. Now, comparing this to Table 2, um, Table 2 is a strong recommendation and has strong evidence behind it that these are dangerous in older adults and should only be used when absolutely necessary. Table 4 is a list of medications that has weaker evidence and therefore should be a patient-physician conversation about whether or not it would benefit the patient to continue this medication or even start this medication. An example for this is aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease or prevention of colorectal cancer. Table five is a list of potentially clinically important drug-drug interactions that should be avoided in older adults, such as steroids and NSAIDs or lithium with ACE inhibitors or loop diuretics. Table six is a reminder that as patients get older, their renal function declines. And there are some medications that have absolute contraindications in renal dysfunction, or at least should be dose reduced. A big example of this are DOACs or antibiotics such as Cipro and Bactrim. Table seven is a reminder that there are a lot of medications with anticholinergic properties that become intolerable for patients in the 65 and older age group, such as first generation antihistamines, some early antidepressants, antispasmodics, or muscle relaxants. Table eight is our review of medications that were removed from the 2015 criteria. An example of this is for the syndrome or condition of insomnia. They removed phenylephrine, methylphenidate, and caffeine. I obviously can't sleep if I have caffeine late at night and I am not a geriatric person. So they removed it because it was not unique to the geriatric population. And finally, table nine is a summary of all the medications that were actually added to this year's criteria. One example is glimepiride causing hypoglycemia, which is higher risk in our patient population. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, the first patient and my group discuss this patient in depth. To give everyone a quick overview, this is one of my patients I met a month ago. She was a new patient to us and she was here for medication renewal. She's 78. She has stage one breast cancer, status post lumpectomy 20 years ago, hypertension, and occasional anxiety. Um, here to establish care. Two weeks ago, she developed a rash on her face, some itching, some um, itchy, watery eyes, and a scratchy throat. And she saw dermatology and was given some prescription medications at that time. She's a former smoker. She has a glass of wine most nights. 
she does not use any illicits and she's retired. She's a widow. Her husband died in 1995 and she noticed that her anxiety got worse at that time and got a prescription from her PCP about um, to help with her anxiety at that time. And she actually just moved apartments during coronavirus and she's living in a new apartment building and kind of feels socially isolated at this time. This is her medication list. So she's on Xanax TID. She says usually it's BID, but sometimes CID. And Lodipine, baby aspirin, Benadryl, HCTZ triumphant, hydroxazine, some eye drops, steroid cream, Singulair, and then Ambien. She says the 30 pill prescription will last her an entire year. So Robin was the reporter in our group. Robin, what do we talk about as the potential um, medications that could be worrisome for her? Yeah. So I think we, we initially said sort of seeing the medicine list, which I, I put in the comments if you want to see it. Um, there were a lot of things that worried us in terms of sedative type side effects. Um, and we also thought in this first visit, it would be a good idea to get a sense of what potential side effects might already be occurring. Um, so, so then we talked a little bit about um, kind of in Beer's criteria that sort of table two has a lot of these sort of sedative medicines. And so particularly we've got uh, kind of two first generation antihistamines as well as her benzodiazepine and the, and the zolpidem that kind of fall into this table as you know, medicines that are potentially inappropriate and we need to think about. Um, so then we tried to sort of talk about, you know, well, what would we do in this first visit compared to what we would do over the next several? Um, and so we talked a little bit about maybe the first visit is just a building rapport visit, depending on um, kind of how the patient feels about the medicines, um, maybe kind of tackling some of the as needed, especially she's using the um, Zolpidem so infrequently. Um, and then we sort of talked about trying to treat longer term her anxiety that an SSRI might be indicated and might be able to take the place of a number of these medicines. Um, Perfect. Did we and talk about the triametrine? I'm sorry. Did we talk about the triametrine? Why is she on it? And, no. And is she on it for edema because she's on amlodipine at the same time? We, did, we didn't get no, to that we, yet. We, we were so bothered by all the sedatives that we didn't talk about her blood pressure regimen. Well, for, correct me if I'm wrong. Triametrine is not a very good blood pressure medicine. Most of the time it's, it's you know, given for edema, um, it's kind of like that case you gave in the beginning. Um, if she has lower extremity edema from the amlodipine, then maybe she's taking two meds where none will do uh, or one would do. I think that's a really important point to make. Um, I'm pretty sure time turn actually isn't on Beer's criterion. So for the sake of this talk, I'm not going to get into it, um, but I agree with you 100%, Haggai. That's on my list of medications to change. <laughs> um, to briefly summarize what Robin talked about, um, we recognize that first-generation antihistamines, benzodiazepines, and the Z drugs are all very contraindicated medications in the elderly population. Benzodiazepines do have very unique um, indications that, such as REM sleep disorder, or if they're going through withdrawals or have seizures, but in general, it increases the risk of cognitive impairment, delirium, falls, and fractures. And Z drugs actually have the unique um, increased risk of ER visits and hospitalizations uh, compared to the other two classes of medications. I briefly wanted to touch on benzo prescribing in the U.S. So this is a national ambulatory medical care survey from 2014 to 2016, and it actually shows that the number of visits per 100 persons, so maybe not unique um, patients, but visits per 100 persons um, where benzos were prescribed actually increases with age, and that increase with age is statistically significant, and there's also a very definite significant um, sex difference as well. So females are prescribed more benzos than males as well. From this same study, we can see whether these benzos were actually a new prescription or a continuation of prescriptions. And for the most part, amongst all the age groups, they were continuation. 
but we can see in our elderly populations, 91% of benzo prescriptions were actually continuations. And so obviously this makes me wonder, is there a continued indication for this medication and why the prescriber is continuing this medication? What are the barriers to deprescribing when we know that this medication class has significant side effects for um, the elderly population? We're gonna briefly just touch on aspirin as another medication that we should consider. This patient is now fast forwarding a year and she's coming to me with rectal bleeding. She's doing much better on a second generation antihistamine, Lexapro and some trazodone, but she's still on a baby aspirin. And so this is from table four in Beer's criteria. So meds to be used with caution because of insufficient evidence and it's moderate age evidence, uh, moderate um, evidence behind this. And again, she doesn't have any known cardiovascular disease. She's never had a heart attack or a stroke. And so obviously we'll have to work up the etiology of her rectal bleeding, but this visit is definitely going to prompt me to think, why does this patient need to be on aspirin and is it really indicated? And Dr. Sharma is gonna report his thoughts on some of the medications. Um, case two is a 67-year-old man with past medical history of hypertension, arthritis, peptic ulcer disease, currently status post hip replacement, here for an annual physical. He requests refills of all his medications. Um, here's the medication list. There's acetaminophen, chlorthalidone, ibuprofen, lisinopril, oxycodone, and protonics. Okay, so... Um... We talked about, so he's 67, not quite 75, so he's not, um, we didn't think he was totally in a danger zone, and it looked like he was appropriately using his um, uh, analgesics, uh, so we weren't too concerned about that. Uh, we did raise some concerns just on chlorothalidone. It just needs to be monitored, especially in the elderly. They can get pretty significant hyponatremia and hypokalemia, and um, the protonics was the medicine we thought um, we should investigate um, a it probably doesn't that's a very high dose uh, bid dosing uh, at 40 milligrams probably unnecessary um, uh, for his symptoms although it was prescribed for ulcer but his i think a recent uh, endoscopy showed the ulcer had healed so we discussed how we could um, titrate that off either you know trying to take a holiday or using an h2 blocker to prevent rebound uh, GERD symptoms um, and then the ibuprofen dosing was also, a, TID is, is a little uh, high as well. So we were. Perfect. And the point of this, again, the patient had an acute indication for his ibuprofen. He had arthritis. He's technically not meeting the Beers criteria, age cutoff, so age 75, who put them at high risk for peptic ulcer disease, and yet he still developed it. Um, he was on oxycodone post-op, and that was appropriately given a time limit on how many days of our pills he was given. And then it's the PPI that puts him at risk for C. diff infection, bone loss, and bone fractures. So again, he was appropriately, or he was treated with a PPI for his peptic ulcer disease, but now that that has since resolved, and he's not on NSAIDs anymore for his arthritis because he has his hip replaced, there definitely is no continued risk for peptic ulcer disease, and therefore that should be discontinued. Dr. Ayub's group, I'll let you do case three. Yeah, 85-year-old gentleman with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, he's got an A1C of 7.6 in the past, arthritis and peripheral neuropathy here for a physical before, quote, COVID gets bad again. He was last seen in July of 2019. Um, his med list is there and on his annual lab work, looks like his creatinine has gone from 1.5 to 1.7 and his A1C is 7.4. Team VHC, do you have like a, some good take home points for, for this case? What our esteemed senior resident Hagai had, had pointed out, um, a couple of things. One, um, it's a question of is his worsening kidney disease? Uh, he's 85, does he need to be on the um on his statin anymore or have he kind of maxed out the benefit um when he was a little bit younger so that's one medication two can you come a little closer to the mic again I'm sorry 
the second aspect of it is um, with his high increasing GFR or, or decreasing GFR and increasing creatinine, um, can his gabapentin dose be uh, reduced a little bit? And also just needing to go through and really, renally dose all these medications. Maybe his lisinopril can come down. May, with an A1C of 7.4, I mean, we don't have to be super strict in an 85 year old about getting A1 with A1C. So perhaps we can either come down on his glargine um, or uh, come down as metformin or alter some of those me medications that way. Um, and then we, there was some question at the end about does he need to be taking Tylenol every six hours? Um, ideally not every day is what we, our group discussed. Perfect. So I think this comes up from table six in um, Beer's criteria where we are worried about renally dosing medications. And again, this patient had peripheral neuropathy from his underlying diabetes. And now that his GFR has dropped below 60, we have to think about renally dosing it. And I like that you brought up that there are other medications that we can probably readjust given his decreased renal function and improved glycemic control. Um, so again, Beer's criteria is a guideline, but definitely using your clinical um, decision-making as well can be important. So I'll briefly talk about deprescribing. I know we have about six minutes left. So deprescribing is a systematic process where we identify and discontinue medications where the existing or potential harms actually outweigh the benefits within the context of an individual patient's care goals, their current level of functioning, life expectancy, values, or preferences. So this again is in contrast to goal-directed therapy or guidelines which are population-based and deprescribing is very individualized. So there are many factors that play into it. So physician factors, obviously time, it takes time to go through medications and deprescribe. We actually worry about uh, patient resistance as well. So we think that patients are not gonna like the idea of taking them off of medications. Whereas there was actually a 2018 study of about 2000 Medicare beneficiaries who said that 92% um, would be willing to stop taking one or more of their medications if a physician said it was possible, and 67% actually wanted to reduce the total number of medications that they were on. The other barrier for physicians is the EMR. Like I talked about, we have so many different ways to get a medication list. Um, we are oftentimes dealing with not updated medication lists, so that's one added um, factor that goes into it. Patient factors, on the other hand, um, fear of side effects coming off of these medications, the want for a prescription pill to deal with some of their symptoms when pharmacologic treatment may not actually be the most ideal. And then we have scary primary care doctors like Dr. Murphy here, um, and patients don't want to go against their known doctors or other doctors who may have initially prescribed this medication. They'll say, well, Dr. Murphy gave this medication to me 20 years ago, and I want to stay on it because that's what he said was good for me back then. And trying to go past that inertia can be a patient factor to deprescribing. So the ABIM put out a choosing wisely statement about um, four recommendations for deprescribing. A lot of them we've already touched on through our cases, but I'll highlight them briefly. So one is that we don't initiate medications to treat symptoms unless you already know that these symptoms are not related to some medication or non-compliance to medication. Recommendation number two is that anytime you have a patient on five or more medications, you actually do a comprehensive medication reconciliation and determine whether or not these medications are already needed so that we can add on um, before you start adding on another medication. Recommendation number three is that you don't continue medications based on what's in the computer unless you verify it. The statement recommends that, recommends that a pharmacist continue or do the verification, but obviously we in the clinic or on admission can do that as well. And then finally, specific to discharge, you don't want to continue home medications unless you know that the patient still needs that medication. And also think about this in light of any new medications that you are sending the patient home on. I want to briefly bring your attention to a website that Angelica, one of the blessed seven nurses who rotated um, with our NPs in our clinic, um, brought my attention to, and it's called deprescribing.org. It's a website put out by the Canadian government, and it actually has evidence-based guidelines 
on the risks and deprescribing algorithms for certain medications. So specifically for benzos, they have this great website about deprescribing guidelines and algorithms. And then patient handout pages that you can actually give to your patients to give them some background information so that when you readdress this at a subsequent visit, the patient is already informed and has some idea about what you're going to talk about um, and that there's evidence behind it. I also like that they have some information about how to manage some of the symptoms that come with withdrawal or that were the initial indication for prescribing in the first place. So you're giving your patient options for treatment. So in summary, polypharmacy, five or more drugs for our patients, it's sometimes indicated we have six patients, six patients here at Georgetown, but it definitely can have serious patient consequences. Beer's criteria, which was updated in 2019, can be a great resource for looking at inappropriate medications for older adults and providing information as to what those side effects or complications can be. And then deprescribing. There are definitely physician and patient factors as to why we do it, but to be honest, patients want to do it. So we as physicians should not be afraid to deprescribe and don't be afraid to say no to drugs. So that is the end of my talk. It's a public service reminder that everyone should still wear their masks covering their nose and their mouth. Thank you, everyone.